You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. You're tuned to KCSB 91.9 FM in Santa Barbara, streaming worldwide online at kcsb.org. Wesley Rowe is here in the studio this morning, co-founder of the Santa Barbara Permaculture Network. Hi, Wes. Hi, Jill. Wes and I are going to be talking with Starhawk, writer, permaculture teacher, earth activist, and earth activist trainer. Starhawk is the author of 10 books on earth-based spirituality, including Web of Power, Notes from the Global Uprising, The Fifth Sacred Thing, and Earth Earth Path, Grounding Your Spirit in the Rhythms of Nature. And Starhawk is an activist. She's well known as a theorist of paganism and is one of the foremost popular voices of ecofeminism. Starhawk is internationally known as a trainer in nonviolence and direct action and as an activist within the peace, women's, environmental, and anti globalization movements. So it sounds like you're very active, Starhawk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Starhawk travels and teaches widely in North America, Europe, and the Middle East, giving lectures and workshops. We have a lot to talk about today, and I thought we could just start off with, maybe for those listeners who, who are not as familiar with your work as Wes and I are, could you tell us, tell them what you spend your time doing and what your passion and mission in life is? I sort of started off many, many years ago uh, interested in feminism and spirituality and particularly in the old earth-based religions of the goddess, because I felt that the way that we view the spirit is really integrally tied to the way we view ourselves as women or each other as human beings. And so for many, many years I've been teaching people to create ritual, to do spiral dances. But over the last, I'd say, 15, 20 years, I felt more and more of a need to ground that in the actual Earth, and that was what led me first to taking a permaculture design course and now uh, to teaching, and most of my work now is really about weaving together the spiritual with the actual practical, hands-on, you know, how you actually heal a piece of soil, right, Mm -hmm. not just sing about healing the earth. Um, And with that, for me, it's always tied also to how do we take action on a larger scale? How do we shift not just ourselves individually, but our communities and our society to be more in balance with nature and with the earth? And, of course, right now we're in a time of absolute urgency for making that happen. So you feel, it seems like from a lot of the writings that I've read of yours, you feel it's really important for us, and maybe especially as Westerners, to reconceive our connection to the earth. Well, we're really faced with the practical task right now of transforming our um, basis of technology, our basis of power and energy, and our economy um, rapidly, like not, you know, over the next century, but in the next 10, 20 years, uh, unless we want to face horrific environmental consequences that are, you know, almost too scary to think about. And in order to do that, we have to reconceive how we relate to the earth, how we see ourselves in relationship with the earth and with nature. And when you were teaching um, your women's, you know, women's empowerment and your um, rituals, was there a turning point where all of a sudden you thought, I really want to ground this and kind of, you were talking about reconnecting with the earth and being an activist. Was there a specific thing that happened or was it more a gradual transformation, would you say? I'd say it was a gradual transformation. I mean, I've always... Uh, you know, my very first circle was called the Compost Coven, right? <laughs> you know? I've always done that. Um, I've always loved to garden, um, you know, though I haven't always had a place where I could do that. But in the late 80s, 
Uh, I met a woman up in Vancouver named Susan Davidson uh, who came to one of my workshops who had just taken a permaculture design course. And she was so excited about it, and I began reading about it. And a lot of the ideas uh, went into some of my writing, both in Truth or Dare and in The Fifth Sacred Thing, the novel that I wrote in the early 90s. That's a kind of futuristic vision of both the positive and the negative trends of what could come to be. Um, But it was in the middle 90s I met a woman named Penny Livingston Stark uh, at a Bioneers conference. And we became friends and began talking. And she was a wonderful permaculture designer and teacher and who also herself has a great connection to spirituality. And she said, let's do a course together. I said, well, Penny, I've never even taken a permaculture course. I've got to do that first. And uh, But I can never find one that works at the right time. So we scheduled one together and co-taught it, uh, I think that was in 96. Um, she taught all the permaculture, and I taught all the lovely spiritual woo-woo stuff. <laughs> and, <laughs> right? uh, and then I came home and went, hmm, you know, I have to figure out how to do this. <laughs> you know, it's uh, you know one of the wonderful things about both permaculture and spirituality. I think is that they shift your way of thinking from looking at things as objects and isolated objects to actually seeing relationships mm-hmm. and how things work in relationships. And though that sounds very simple. You know, it's actually challenging when you try to apply it, even on a, a garden scale. I mean, I was one of those, uh, you know, I always say there's, you know, there's people who like to go to bed with a copy of Playboy, and there's people who like to go to bed with something like the White Flower Farm catalog, you know, right? <laughs> and lust over Or the Sunset Rose Western or, Garden you know, book, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was sort of the latter kind of person, and I had, you know... I we had gotten some land up in northern California. For the first time I had a garden that actually had some sun, which I don't have in the city and so I was getting, you know, that rose and that rose and this color scheme and then permaculture makes you really shift all that and kind of go, Well, wait a minute, it's not really about that particular rose, however pretty it is, it's about how does this plant interact with the other plant with the place you're putting it you know, what are its yields, what are its needs, what is it giving to the system, what is it taking from the system, how do I create a system that itself, you know, can as much as possible provide for what it needs and um, take all the resources that come on to that, you know, particular piece of land, whether it's water, whether it's fertility, or whether it's uh, sun, and get the maximum amount of use out of it. I, I loved on one of your, I think it was on your, is it Wikipedia? Is that how you pronounce that? Oh. How you said that permaculture, Patrick Whitefield, I think, had a great definition of its creating beneficial relationships. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, he came and guest taught at one of our Earth Activist trainings in England, and it was wonderful to get to meet him. In your book, The Fifth Sacred Thing, which I read many years ago and I loved it, it seems like your vision or your the your the way you saw San Francisco in that book in the San Francisco area was really permaculture it was infused with permaculture and city repair. I was really struck by how much it, it was almost like you saw, had a vision of the future in that book. Well, I had been reading and talking to people a lot about permaculture when I wrote it, so it was very much on my mind when I wrote that book. And it has been wonderful to see, you know, the ways in which not just San Francisco but other cities right now seem to be taking the climate change challenge and actually putting into place some of the ideas that permaculturalists have been talking about forever. City Repair is this wonderful group up in Portland, Oregon, Uh, that's truly visionary and mad and imaginative, and they have been taking intersections and uh, turning them into gathering places and painting mandalas in the middle of the street and doing a village building convergence every spring where they bring people in from all over the world to learn natural building techniques and do public art projects and create permaculture gardens. And all of this is legalized and supported, actually, by the city of Portland. Mm -hmm. Here in San Francisco, you know, we've had some 
amazing initiatives. You know, we now have the city committed to begin collecting all the waste vegetable oil from restaurants and fast food places and turning it into biodiesel to run its fleet. You know, that's something we talked about as a permacultural dream for a long time, and now it's becoming a reality. Yes, well, in your book, I, it really made me want to move to Northern California <laughs> well, and get out of San Francisco. Know, that, it didn't really mean to, like, you know, in the book, Southern California is kind of like the the negative vision of the future, and it wasn't that. I, I wanted to diss poor old Southern California. It was just, I needed two locations I knew, and I grew up in Southern California, and I live in Northern California, and I didn't want to have to go live in Chicago or someplace for a year in order to get all the details right. So. Well, I loved what you, I I've, uh, was looking through your book recently just because of this interview, and I loved about how you were talking about water was such a precious resource in in Northern California, you know, in the Fifth Sacred Thing, and how in Southern California it was actually being sold and mm-hmm. monopolized. Yeah, unfortunately, there's a lot of the negative vision of the future in that book that has come to pass much more clearly, or seems about to, than some of the positive vision. But I did write it in the middle of a drought, so that was definitely <laughs> on my mind. Well, Starhawk, now you are training earth activists, and can you tell our listeners what what that means and what that training is about? Well, the earth activist training takes a permaculture design course, which is a pretty standardized 72-hour curriculum that's recognized worldwide by the permaculture community. And we overlay it with training in organizing, training in activism, training in policymaking, and uh, with a grounding in earth-based spirituality. So it's a pretty intensive two weeks, um, but it's a wonderful experience. You know, we actually we have a course coming up in May in Southern California uh, that's going to have a special emphasis on some of the social aspects of permaculture because I'm co-teaching it with two wonderful friends, Margo Adair and Bill All, who do work with diversity training and organizational development. Uh, And that's the amazing thing about permaculture and the principles is that they don't just apply to your garden, but they can actually apply to how you form an organization. Um, When we started, we were very much linked into a lot of the activism around global justice and peace and anti-war activism, and we're still committed to that. But right now, We're in a time, I think, where a lot of doors are open uh, in things like local governments and city governments. And so part of the emphasis on the organizing, for me, is shifting around policymaking, you know, knowing and understanding uh, what are the things that we actually need to do around climate change and how might we use the resources we still have as a society and the tiny little bit of leeway that we still have got to make a shift into a different kind of technology and economy and world um, that can be kind of a graceful and gradual energy descent rather Mm -hmm. than a crash, a complete form of destruction. So we focus a lot on things like um, bioremediation, knowing how to actually heal and cleanse soil and water, using natural means. Um, We cover the whole spectrum of alternative technology and natural building and sustainable gardening and forestry and energy conservation. But I think the wonderful thing about, again, about permaculture and about coming from, you know, a sort of magical spiritual perspective is that you're always looking at how all these things work together. You're not just saying, here's the one solution, but... You know, here's the here's the mosaic we need to put into place. Here's the web that we need to weave. And does your spiritual connection with the earth, does that really fuel your activism? How does that come to play in your work? For me, you know, my spiritual connection and my activism are, they're like both the same thing. You know, um, you know if you really believe the earth is sacred, not in the sense that, you know, it's something you bow down to, but in the sense that it's what's most important and it's also what feeds and nurtures and inspires and heals you, uh, then you you just can't sit back and watch idiots do stupid things and not try to 
get in the way to stop them and to put into place alternatives that are going to be better. Uh, and at the same time, when you're doing that kind of work, which can be hard and can be discouraging, you know, you really need to have some sort of way to replenish your own spirit and replenish your connection with the natural world. Mm-hmm. And so for me, um, being able to practice the rituals, the meditation, uh, just taking the time to be in nature each day and observe and ground and look and listen and let myself be fed, that's what helps me keep going. It feeds you on a deep level. Mm -hmm. I wanted to remind our listeners that you're tuned to KCSB 91.9 FM in Santa Barbara. I'm Jill Cloutier for Sustainable World. My guests today are writer, permaculture teacher, earth activist, and earth activist trainer, Starhawk, and Wesley Rowe of the Santa Barbara Permaculture Network. And Wes, did you have any questions for Starhawk that you would like to... Yeah. Um, I first want to uh, mention Starhawk's website, uh, www.starhawk.org, and also her website for the Earth Activist Training, which is www.earthactivisttraining.org. And uh, Starhawk, I know you uh, just recently you were deported from uh, Israel, and um, could you talk about uh, you know Israel and Palestine and its connection to you over a long period of time? And maybe um, kind of talk about uh, the pain and the uh, suffering that goes on in Israel, too. I think you mentioned in an article that you sent out to the Internet called uh, Denied. You talked a little bit about the Holocaust and how, you know, civilizations that uh, face ethnic cleansing never seem to heal. You know, it just goes on and on and on and and then become the uh, perpetuator of suffering. Yeah, I um, was on my way a couple weeks ago, actually, to Israel and Palestine to work with some of the green groups and the ecology groups there, but I was not allowed in because of the work I've done in the past with groups that support some of the nonviolent resistance against the occupation. And, um, you know, that was a very deep disappointment for me, um, I grew up, you know, I was born Jewish in 1951, so I grew up in the 50s when World War II and the Holocaust, you know, were very, very present. They, you know, they were just, had happened, you know, just a, a few years before, and, you know, our, we had families we knew who had taken in refugees. My parents were social workers who had worked with some of the kids who had come out of the camps or were refugees. So it, it's something that is present and be, it becomes part of you in a very, very deep way. So I really understand the kind of legacy of fear and trauma that is there in the whole Jewish community. Um, you know, I, I kind of see the conflict in Israel and Palestine, in in a way, it's like playing out the same kinds of dynamics that happen in families when you have an abused child who grows up to become an abuser. And, you know, it's hard because the abuser inside feels like an abused child, right? It's like, help, you know, I'm, I'm the one who's hurt. I'm the one who's, you know, being threatened. And, of course, there's a reality to that in Israel. There is threat, and people do get hurt. Um, but I have also been there enough to see the incredible damage that's being done to the Palestinians, obviously, and also to the Israelis by attempting to occupy and control, you know, to more than 2 million people in the West Bank and in Gaza. Um, you know, when you're on the Palestinian side, you can't, you know, to go from your village into the nearest town where you might work or go to school, uh, you have to go through checkpoints and you never know whether you're going to be able to get through or not get through. Um, You know, you're at risk all the time of uh, just being arrested, being shot. You can be held for months with an administrative detention uh, without a hearing, without any kind of recourse. And, 
people around you are getting shot and getting killed every single day. Um, you know, so it's a, a kind of constant ongoing sense of frustration and threat and humiliation uh, that makes it really difficult for people to do the kinds of positive things that, you know, we would like to do. I mean, I visited a permaculture institute there uh, when I was there four years ago that had been shut down by the Israelis and basically the entrance had been bulldozed and the whole place had been trashed um, just because I think in some sense the idea of Palestinian independence and self-sustainability uh, is very threatening to the whole dynamic there. Um, you know, I I think it's a really, really hard situation to intervene in, but I had been there supporting some of the nonviolent efforts at resistance uh, with a group called the International Solidarity Movement, because I saw a nonviolent movement, you know, as, as like a tiny ray of hope in this cycle of violence and revenge. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's very challenging there because even the nonviolent movement has a lot of difficulty getting visibility, getting seen. Um, you know, there's such an entrenched sense of separation there that, uh, you know, it, it's almost hard to believe, but, you know, because it's in such a, a tiny, tiny space. <laughs> That's but, what I was just thinking. Yeah. You know, like when I first went there, one of the things that shocked me was realizing that the Israeli cell phone network and the Palestinian cell phone network couldn't call each other. You couldn't call one from the other phone. Like, they had no connection. <laughs> I found that, like, astounding. But after I'd been there for a few weeks, I re it wasn't astounding at all. It was like, of course, why would they ever call each other? They never have any contact with each other. You know, it's only a few crazy internationals who come who might need to talk to our friends on both sides. You know, I had good Israeli friends who worked in the peace movement for years and years and years. I remember when one woman decided to help me get back to Beit Zahur, where I was doing a training after I'd been in Jerusalem. And we went to the checkpoint in Bethlehem, and she was arguing in good Israeli fashion, you know, like yelling at the soldiers, you know, to let her drive me across. And I was kind of saying, just let me out. I'll walk across. I'll get a taxi on the other side. That's what we would usually do. And she's like, no, no, I'm going to take you, you know. So she talked him into it, and she drove me, you know, across this, like, 200 yards of the checkpoint. And I realized she was terrified. I've never been across before. I've never been into the West Bank, you know. And she, you know, she's a longtime peace activist in Israel who lived 20 minutes away from there her entire life. So the separation runs extremely deeply. And um, unfortunately, it's becoming more and more and more entrenched as... Uh, the politicians refuse to talk to each other, and as they make moves that uh, I often think about them. I, I had a screenwriting teacher once who used to say about somebody's script, if he didn't like it, he'd say, he writes as if you know he'd heard about people, but he'd never actually met any. And I often think they do politics like that, as if they'd heard about people, but they never actually met any. <laughs> the assumption that if you don't talk to people, that'll bring them around, or if you oppress people more or bomb people more, that will make them give in to you, and instead what it does is it creates deeper and deeper resistance. Starhawk, uh, I had uh, the camp that you talked about that the Israelis closed down, um, I had an email from it when it was being attacked, and they were saying there's both Israel people from Israel and people from Palestine here were working to heal. They're just coming at us with tanks. And it was like the last email I got from them. And it was amazing. They were trying to appeal to the world. 
um, that we were trying to change the energy. Could you talk a little bit about the, the camp on, uh, on the West Bank that you were going to, and especially all their efforts? I think it's called, was it Marta Farms? Yes, it's actually the, there's a new um, permaculture uh, group that has started up on the West Bank in the same village as the old one was. That's the Marta Permaculture Farm, and it was started by um, a man who uh, lived at the farm in Tennessee for many years in the mm-hmm. U.S. Uh, and they're attempting now to form a new permaculture institute to uh, start, again, teaching people and training people and also developing you know, the skills and the resources that people need there uh, to survive in that situation. Um, one of the beautiful things is that um, many of the green groups and the permaculture groups in Israel have been supportive of some of these efforts in Palestine, and uh, those groups seem to be able to work together and get along with each other, which I guess to me speaks of the just sort of the vision that if you actually really care about the earth and you really care about the land, then you actually have to also care about all the people of the land. And um, you understand that land is something you serve. It's not something you own and something that you claim. So the Marta Permaculture Farm um, is also being supported by the global permaculture community and uh, the Global Village Institute in Tennessee has been helping to serve as their fundraising arm. Um, if people are interested, you know, if people are looking for something to contribute to that could actually help bring some peace in that area, um, you know, they can contribute to the Global Village Institute, which is P.O. Box 90 in Summertown, Tennessee, and the zip code is 3848. Three, and that that money will really help them survive and help them uh, build some of the tools of self reliance and tools of being able to feed people that you need in that situation. The the Marta Farms training you were doing was really focused on working with the farmers, wasn't it? They actually are going ahead with the training there, and they have found some wonderful people who work with an amazing permaculturalist named Jeff Lawton. We're going to come and do a training that's actually going on starting now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's working both with local people, local farmers, local women, and also with agricultural engineers. Um, one, of the, you know, one of the strengths in the Palestinian community is that it's a community that deeply values education. And in spite of all of the stresses and oppression and everything else, you know, there are a number of universities on the West Bank. Uh, There's a a very high value on educating your children, partly because people see that as one ticket out of the situation that they're in. And so um, there is a lot of interest among the agricultural engineers and among Uh, the culture in general around these ideas about sustainability. And the thing is that Palestinian agriculture, you know, in many ways is already very permacultural. It's very, the traditional agriculture, very oriented toward minimal use of water, toward growing the crops that grow well in that kind of climate in that area, um, making the maximum use of every aspect of every resource, because just like every traditional culture, you know, they had to. They didn't have any choice. And especially now, I think some of those lessons are deeply valuable. Starhawk, I I was, in reading about your work, it seems that you not only do your work in the States and in San Francisco and maybe Santa Barbara, places like that, but you also are drawn to more of the the, maybe you went to New Orleans and did some work there after the disaster there, and now in Israel and Palestine. That's a very different part of your work. How is that for you, having to go from your home here and then go into these areas where there's a lot of need? Well, you know, I'm a very privileged person. I live in an incredibly beautiful place 
Uh, we have a collective house in San Francisco, and we have land up in western Sonoma County. Uh, so, and like any permaculturist, I always have a million things to do at home. So it's always hard to leave, and it's always a bit of a wrench to leave. But I feel, you know, a call to bring some of these ideas and techniques insofar as I have them, to the places where they're really most needed and where people aren't so privileged. Um, One of the reasons I went to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina was, you know, you know how it is, we're always talking about the world's ending or the world's going to fall apart or the system's unsustainable, it's going to crash or the revolution's going to come or the apocalypse is going to happen, you know, and... I went to New Orleans because I wanted to see what does it look like when it really happens, you know, when it really does all fall apart, and more particularly, like, do we actually have anything to offer in that situation? Uh, Do we have any useful skills? Do we have any useful ideas? Uh, Do we have useful ways of organizing? And what I found there was, in fact, that we do, that it was... You know, all the the big systems that are supposed to be in place for disasters, things like the military and FEMA and even the Red Cross, were either missing in action or completely non-functional. And the things that were working were small, grassroots, you know, people just getting together and doing what needed to be done kinds of organizations. So we worked with a group called Common Ground Relief, that had started from uh, an organizer in an area of New Orleans that didn't flood. It's an area called Algiers. Uh, and Malik Rahim was an old, you know, community organizer from Black Panther days, you know, back in the 60s. He put out a call that went out through activist networks, and all kinds of people showed up to help. You know, it was an amazing combination of people that, turned up. Yeah, I remember one day I was sitting there and I realized, you know, I was sitting in a group of, there was me, there was a nuclear engineer, and there was an environmental engineer, and there was a PhD in mathematics, and we were all sitting around trying to plan out how we were going to build a composting toilet. <laughs> you know? uh, it was, you know, just amazing combinations of people yeah, a meeting of the minds mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know there were people who came down who set up a medical clinic that was up and running and serving people long before the red cross ever arrived and got into place um you know there was food distribution going on there were supplies there were uh, just lots and lots and lots of incredible efforts that happened so that was very inspiring and very affirming The flip side of it, though, was realizing that as wonderful as all of that was, there was just no way it could function on the scale that it needed to happen to deal with the the scale of that disaster. You know, all the things that we could do just felt like a tiny drop in the bucket compared to what actually needed to happen there. And unfortunately, all of those efforts were not able to muster together enough political clout to actually get the poor who had been basically, you know, chased out, drowned out, pushed out of New Orleans to um, get them back, to get the resources that they needed to come back, to get the public housing reopened instead of bulldozed down. Do you see a need then, Starhawk, for people to be trained in maybe sustainable disaster relief? That's, uh, I think, a big need, um, especially as we move into a period of time, you know, where at best right, there's going to be more and more storms, more disasters, more intense hurricanes, uh, more droughts. Um, and that's one of the interesting aspects that's sort of developing in the permaculture community. Um, I also work with a group called Permaculture First Responders that has been doing trainings uh, kind of designed to do just that, prepare people to go and intervene in places where there has been disasters. 
uh, and that's also part of what we try to weave into our earth activist trainings. Um, you know, knowing the things that we have learned from setting up kind of encampments for mobilizations and for actions uh, or for gatherings like the Rainbow Gathering or uh, Burning Man or things. Those are actually really useful skills for having when there's been a disaster or an emergency. And some of the things that we do just you know, as part of our normal, you know, how we garden, how we live kinds of things. Like I'll never forget one day in New Orleans when we were cleaning up garbage in this neighborhood uh, that hadn't been collected, you know, in about five weeks after the hurricane and just this sort of horrible, stinky, rotty, maggoty stuff. And one of my friends turned to me and she said, you know, I never realized it before, but composting is actually a survival skill. And yeah, that's true, because if people had been composting, then the garbage wouldn't be a problem. Um, you know, I, I find that there's a great enthusiasm and excitement around these ideas wherever they're presented, and especially when they can be kind of uh, made manifest in some way. You know, in New Orleans... You know, we did trainings for a lot of people around bioremediation, and there was a lot of interest and enthusiasm around it. You know, it was a challenging situation because most people weren't even back yet or weren't there. People were there. They were often kind of overwhelmed just dealing with their own lives, but there was definitely a consciousness. And that's, that's one of the things about those awful times when everything does crash down or when disasters happen at the same time, it kind of opens up a sense of possibility uh, and it opens up a space where things can happen that might not happen otherwise. I'd like to uh, shift your this question over to your work with the WTO because I think it was very important work that you did and um, I think you, you've kind of explained it in your article on spiritual activism, how, how you must come against, you know, show that there's an opposition to a force of power in our in our society when things seem out of control and seem like it's so distant and you can't do anything that there is a way of of presenting yourself as a person to challenge what's happening to challenge and see if you can shift the discussion shift the energy and i know you been at the the one up in Seattle, the one up in Quebec, and the one in um, Cancun. And um, maybe you can just explain the whole idea around, you know, that you've incorporated into going to these protests, greening them too, but also just the whole focus you had on being there. Well, part of the whole um, philosophy and idea around nonviolence and particularly nonviolent direct action is that we actually have a kind of power, you know, that's, that's different from the power of force and violence, um, the power of the authorities, the power of the guns and the bombs. You know, it's the power, I call it power from within. Um, you know, the kind of power we feel when we create, when we build, when we um, face a fear when we take action around something. And that those systems of power over and control actually only exist, they can only function when in some way we give up some of our power from within and and give them a kind of tacit consent to their operation. Um, so when we want to shift them and change them and stop them, we have to withdraw that consent. And one of the ways we actively withdraw it is sometimes by getting in the way of their operations, interfering with them. Uh, and one of the other ways we can actively withdraw it is by creating clear alternatives and sometimes creating them when you can, when you can do them both at once, you know, when you can create the alternative vision and do it right in the face of the oppressive power, 
then you have actions that are, I think, tremendously inspiring and um, and powerful. And so what happened with things like the WTO, the kind of the institutions that supported the whole structure of corporate globalization was that people began saying, um, we're going to get in their way. You know, we're going to oppose them. Uh, we're going to withdraw our consent by protesting against them. And we did that in the streets in Seattle in 1999 and disrupted the WTO meeting there. Um, I went again to Cancun in 2003, and and that time we um, also went down with a group of permaculturalists and with the idea of creating some permaculture demonstration sites in the encampment that they were going to have. They had a big encampment of farm workers and campesinos and indigenous people that had come from all over Mexico to be part of these protests. Um, one of the issues on the agenda for the WTO at that meeting also was agriculture and the subsidies that the big countries give to big agricultural corporations, which actually have a very, very destructive effect on the ability of small farmers around the world to actually make a living and um, continue their traditional forms of growing crops and feeding their families. So we created um, like a hand-washing station, showers, a gray water system for the encampment, and it was actually quite beautiful. It was uh, this funny little system. It was like a little like a Rube Goldberg machine, you know, <laughs> those complicated <laughs> little things. It caught rain off the canopy that covered the eating area, and then we had a little hand pump of with a bicycle wheel that pumped it up to a little container that then dribbled it down through the sinks where you could wash your hands, and then it went through the gray water. It was really cute, and it was also really, for me, very affirming because, you know, I mean, we had it up and going for about 15 minutes when a woman walked over to me and was talking to me and was saying, you know, this is interesting. I've never seen a pump like that, you know, and trying it out and saying, you know, in my village, we don't have any running water. We can't afford thousands of dollars for the electrical pump, but this would work. <laughs> and my friend Eric uh, said at that, toward the end, at one point, this five-year-old girl came up to him and took him, sort of started explaining the whole thing to him and took him on a whole system of how the rain came down and the pump brought it up and all that. And he realized that she had seen this thing and she had this, complete understanding of an integrated system. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've done a number of things like that in Scotland for the G8 protests in 2005. Uh, we set up an eco-encampment and did a special training for uh, some of the local activists there to give them the skills and understandings for doing that. Since then, they've been doing climate change camps in England, where they have used many of the same techniques and skills. Uh, and, you know, what we have found is that over the time when we have been doing these protests since 1999, um, some of the things that we protested against, like the free trade area of the Americas, which was going to extend NAFTA throughout the whole Western Hemisphere, um, basically... That's dead in the water. The WTO is barely functional. Um, we've had enormous success in impacting these institutions. It doesn't mean that we've solved all the world's problems or, you know, created economic justice all over the globe, but we definitely have uh, shifted what, what was a, a complete unspoken consensus about, you know, how great globalization was and how wonderful this was for everybody, and there's no question about it, um, we've definitely shifted that awareness and that consciousness and uh, created a whole different kind of dialogue and understanding about global economics. 
Could I ask uh, one more question there, Jill? Yeah. Um, I would love Starhawk to talk about something that seems funny but very powerful learning was the uh, the raid and capture of the seed balls. <laughs> oh, yes, I, love <laughs> I that. think in, in Seattle. <laughs> Oh, wait, that, no, was, in... that was in Sacramento. <laughs> yeah. um, we had gone there. The it was in the, sort of the lead up to uh, that the WTO in two thousand and three. The U.S. Department of Agriculture had called this big conference to basically promote genetic engineering and industrial agriculture to the whole world, and. Um, we had gone there to protest it, and we decided as part of that protest, you know, we would try to show the positive alternatives and not just complain about the negatives. So we had done some permaculture workshops at the warehouse that had been rented to be the, uh, you know, the place where we had meetings and stuff. And uh, my friend Eric, who also teaches with us with the Earth Activist Trainings, you know, he had done this wonderful workshop, and they had made seed balls. Seed balls are a technique that comes from Masanobu Fukuoka, who's a wonderful Japanese farmer who invented this whole method of no-till agriculture, natural farming, where you take, you know, seeds like, you know, your crop plus something that will fix nitrogen like clovers and feed them plus other things that make a guild, that make a self-sustaining little group of plants, and you roll them up in clay and with a little compost, and then you can kind of toss them out on the landscape, and when the rains come, the clay will melt, the compost will feed them, and they can sprout. Um, so we would made seed balls, and they had been left to dry in the parking lot, and we got this uh, call at 6 in the morning you know, at the organizer's house saying, come down, come down, they're, they're arresting the seed balls, they're raiding the place. <laughs> so we went down there, and sure enough, there were like 12 cop cars out there. <laughs> they had their guns out, you know, very anxiously collecting up the seed balls <laughs> on the grounds that they were projectile weapons that we were manufacturing <laughs> to throw at people and, you know, <laughs> break windows with, you know. <laughs> we were sort of trying to make rational arguments like you know if we really wanted to break windows sacramento doesn't lack rocks you know we don't really need to manufacture like stones yeah um, what, what a yeah. good claim to fame right <laughs> and the irony was they were packing them away they had brought all these empty boxes from the police station and the boxes all had labels on them they all said things like pepper spray tear gas <laughs> bullets we we're kind of saying look you guys those things are weapons these things are seeds, you know. <laughs> oh, but so they great. did they did arrest them, and then they proceeded to like spend the day inviting the media to watch them fire them at their ballistics <laughs> wall, you know, <laughs> to show like what kind of impact they had. You couldn't even get them out on bail. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Well, hopefully, there's a field of beautiful plants growing around the ballistics right. wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, it, it really represented a certain gap in consciousness. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so great. Well, in case you just tuned in, you're listening to Sustainable World on KCSB 91.9 FM. And I'm talking with Starhawk, permaculture teacher, author, lecturer, internationally known um, activist, and also Wesley Rowe, uh, who is well known around the world too, as a, as co-founder of the Santa Barbara Permaculture Network. And we're almost out of time. And Starhawk and Wes too, if you have anything else you would like to add um, to say to our listeners, and Starhawk, I'd love to hear too a little bit about how can people deepen their connection to the earth um, in these coming times. Well, for me, you know, I think one of the m most important things in terms of deepening your connection, is just to give yourself a little time to be with the earth every day. And that's my personal spiritual practice. It's what I recommend to people. You know, it doesn't have to be five hours of meditation. It can be ten minutes while you walk to the bus, you know, or uh, half an hour when you walk your dog, or five minutes when you go out and stand in your garden, or 10 minutes when you go stare at the weeds growing in the crack of a vacant lot somewhere. 
but just taking some time to really still your mind and watch and look and listen and observe and let yourself become present to what's around us. And for me, I find that, again, it feeds me in a very deep way. And it's also how you begin to learn a place. And once you learn your own place, then you uh, you sort of know what it is you need to know to connect with any place on the earth. There's a lot of wonderful teaching that's out there and courses that are out there and books that are out there, you know, uh, is mine, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, we do have a, a course coming up in Southern California at a place called Manzanita Springs. In um, it's down between LA and San Diego uh, in May, and um, you know, not just because it's our course, but I think a permaculture course. You can. It's one of the things you can spend two weeks doing that can completely shift your thinking and your understanding of things on both a practical and also a spiritual level. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the few things you can do for in two weeks that can actually open up doors to a new kind of livelihood and to uh, real practical things that you can do to feed yourself, to support yourself, to make a living and, and give yourself some real security in a very uncertain times. Yeah. And there's a lot of other wonderful people that teach. Um, both Penny and I work together with a group called Wilderness Awareness School and a wonderful man named John Young who teaches wilderness awareness. Um, there's a lot of wonderful programs everywhere that teach gardening, that teach um, tracking or teach uh, wildlife ecology and all those things. Uh, I think are really, really valuable for people. The more you learn, the more you know, the more time you give yourself to spend with the earth and with nature, uh, the deeper your connection grows. And growing some of your own food, you know, Mm -hmm. even if it's a pot of mint on your apartment balcony, but just actually growing something that you eat and that you use in some way um, deepens your very, very practical connection with the earth. I have one website here, www.earthactivisttraining.org. And are there others for people to go to? They can go to that, or they can go to my own, which is starhawk.org, and that links to Earth Activist Training and to a lot of other things. People can also sign up there if they want to be on my personal mailing list. Um, I often send out accounts when something interesting happens to me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which sounds like often. <laughs> it happens often. Oh, well, thank you so much, Starhawk, for joining us today. Well, thank you very much. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.